Let's go ahead and pray. Father, um, we just praise you tonight as all-wise and all-knowing. We praise you, Father, because your plan and your purpose has always prevail. And Father, we praise Jesus as our perfect sinless substitute. Help us to open up our hearts and our minds tonight to your word and let it sink deep within our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, as, we, as you studied this passage this week, did, did you reflect maybe upon a time when you were unfairly uh, or unjustly accused of something? It might have crossed your mind, right? Uh, I know I've had those kind of situations in my life before. And, but, you know, as believers, as believers, as Christ followers, we are unjustly accused every day by the unbelieving world, by the media, and even those who claim to be our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it can be a painful thing to endure, especially if the accusation has come from someone that you know and you love and you thought you could trust. Maybe that's happened to you. Well, how does a Christian, how do we respond in a situation like that, right? How did you respond? As you and I go through suffering, do we remember, remember Christ is our standard? Is, he's our standard. Jesus shows us that I and you can be in the will of God. We can be totally obedient to him and yet still endure unjust suffering for his sake. In God's sovereign plan of redemption, Jesus, our King, willingly, willingly offered himself as a sacrifice for sinners. And like Jesus, at some point, we will be unjustly or unfairly judged or accused or ridiculed just because we have an association with Jesus, right? And devotion to Jesus. Um, and so if this hasn't happened to you, don't be surprised when it happens. Uh, we must understand that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. And I think Oswald Chambers, I like Oswald Chambers' uh, writings, he kind of nails it. He says, if we believe in God's sovereignty, then we must believe God has allowed these attacks and unfair accusations. And what we must understand is that God's plans for each one of us for this world serve a higher purpose and will not be thwarted. Just as these false accusations and terrible injustice came against our innocent uh, sinless Savior Jesus, so they will come against his people. And God knew what he was doing. That's, that's the thing that uh, I think you really take from this lesson is that God knew what he was doing then and he knows what he is doing in your life, in your life today and in the world. So my aim tonight, the main truth that I want you to walk away with is God's sovereign plans prevail over all opposition and determine all outcomes. We must believe this, men. God's sovereign plans prevail over all opposition and determine all outcomes. So I've got three divisions tonight, so let's get into the first division, Matthew 26 47 through 56, where Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested. We pick up from last week where Jesus, remember, was submitting to his Father's will and his plan to go to the cross, and he's been strengthened. He, is just, uh, he had just awakened his disciples when Judas appears 
leading a large crowd. That's about 1 a.m. in the morning, okay? Think about that, about 1 a.m. in the morning. John reveals the most uh, details of the circumstances surrounding Jesus' arrest, but here we're told of Judas' betray, betraying kiss. We're also told of Peter's attempt at preventing the arrest, striking the uh, high priest's servant's uh, ear, and Jesus' comment to Peter and the words to those arresting Jesus. So let's read in uh, 47, or 47 through 50, 47 through 50. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus replied, this, this was, to me, it was an odd reply. Friend, friend, really? Friend, do what you came for. Do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. Judas, listen guys, Judas knew the place where they often met. And this betrayal money was likely for the information about Jesus' movements. The religious leaders, you got you to remember, the religious leaders wanted to secretly arrest Jesus to avoid the resistance uh, of the crowds, right? A night arrest in an isolated location really served their purposes. And, and then he brought these, <laughs> all these uh, soldiers with them, right, armed, armed to the hilt. Judas, Judas's kiss, the kiss on either the hand or the cheek, was usually an act of homage and a common gesture of greeting and reverence given to our rabbi by his disciples. He refers to Jesus as rabbi, right? Teacher rather than Lord, suggesting how distanced he was from Jesus. Judas may have felt that his idea of political and material advantages weren't going to happen so that he would only have, that Jesus would only have to experience suffering, but maybe not death. To say Judas is one of the twelve, I think, really highlights how awful this crime was. Now, focus on verse 50. Friend, do what you came for. Jesus still loved Judas. He still loved Judas, and he gives him an out, really. He really wanted him to confess his sin, that he was condemning an innocent man, and repent. Judas still had that guilt, and he didn't go back to Jesus. Jesus steps up to a face an angry mob, ready to move on with God's plan. He stands up for his disciples, take me, let, but let them go. This fulfillment, not by compulsion or weakness, that he surrendered, right? And I think what's clear here, think about what's clear here. Jesus, God, is in control of the situation, right? He's in the driver's seat, not the mob. Jesus was not, and I'm going to repeat this, Jesus was not a helpless victim of circumstances. He was composed and confident in the will of God, his Father. He was committed to his mission. And God had always, he has he had and he always has a sovereign plan and purpose for Jesus to be the substitute for all sinners, to die on our behalf of our sins so that, so that he could save us. That was his plan. Jesus would die the death that we deserve, 
those ready to seize Jesus in other, uh, uh, other uh, gospels, they draw back and they fall to the ground just at the sound of Jesus' words when he says, I am he. So all who are in the presence of the king should fall on their knees as well. Jesus intervened then, and he continues to intervene on our behalf. Now, the Apostle John, if you go to the book of John, tells us that it was impulsive Peter, type A personality, who steps out and in a well-meaning yet self-willed action cuts off the right ear of uh, Malchus, the high priest's servant's ear. Did you stop to think about and consider Peter's state of mind? You know, first of all, he had a lot more sleep than Jesus, right? <laughs> all right. He fell they fell asleep three times, and Jesus was in agony about what was going to take place. But he was in a, he seems to be the type of person whose heart is in the right place, but his understanding was lacking. But he was prayerless, right? Prayerless against temptation, and he took matters into his own hands. He let the pride and fear take hold, and eventually he was led to denial of Jesus. But I want to say that God knew that this would happen. Okay, God knew that it would happen. So Peter's state, I think, reveals the steps that you and I fall into and then, then we may, that may lead us into sin as well. Failure to believe, lack of prayer, disobedience, fear, and denial that we are weak as human beings, right? We're weak. Peter's behavior, I think, illustrates how twisted our morals can become, how fickle we can be. And Christians are capable, think about it, Christians are capable of very diverse and contrary morals. I mean, this, I'm just being honest, right? If you don't believe this, then you're fooling yourself, denying the truth about who, who we are as human beings, right? Right? With one's heart and mind, uh, when one's heart and mind are separated, there's going to be problems. And we do know that Peter, who truly loved Jesus, later not only realized and acknowledged his sin, one that was not premeditated but circumstantial, we know he chose to repent. And his later attitudes and his actions proved that Peter had true faith and trusted in Christ. So let's get back to, to the uh, servants here. <laughs> let's get back to that part of the story. Jesus reveals his majesty here, doesn't he? By touching his ear and he heals it. Peter was trying to defend Jesus. Jesus like, I can take care of myself, okay? But he heals his ear. And then if we read on in 52 through 56, Jesus says, put the sword back in, in, in its place. Jesus said to him, For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call, call my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. That's a legion was 6,000. So that's 72,000 angels, right? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple teaching. You didn't arrest me then. But this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. After him saying all that, <laughs> they, they, they flee. They just they get out of there. Jesus intervened immediately, and he's, he, in essence, says, I don't need your help. Um, this was Satan's uh, time where his power would reign. And Jesus, again, affirms God's plan. That's a key point, another key point. He was fully committed, obediently engaged, to carry through with the Father's plan of redemption. Uh, 
So he could have called 72,000 angels if he had wanted to, and protection through aggression was not the means Jesus wanted for his safety. It was trust in the will of God, which for Jesus and for all of us is found in God's word. He fulfilled the, the prophecies, didn't he? You saw that, Isaiah 53, uh, 12, um, Zechariah 13, 7. And how Jesus really conducted himself revealed his majesty and his care uh, for his own. Think about how humiliating this must have been for the creator of the universe the king of the universe, innocent of no crime, to be arrested and bound by those he had created, to be deserted by those who were closest to him. But yet Jesus remained calm and in tune with his Father's plan. And he did this because he loves us. He loves you and me, and he did it to save us and there was no other way. So my first principle is this. God's sovereign plans overrule all opposition. Did you see that through this part of Scripture? God's sovereign plans overrule all opposition. You know, the Bible is filled with examples that God's sovereign plans overrule opposition. In fact, the Bible itself as a whole, from Genesis to Revelation, confirms this. Jesus is the Messiah and God, and his people win in the end. Good and righteousness will triumph over e evil. And when God acts, no one can reverse it. No one can call back his hand and bring to him to account for his actions, because God does what he pleases, as he pleases, only as he pleases and works out every event to bring about the accomplishment of his will. From the first moment of human history, even to the end, God's will will be done. I think such an unqualified statement bold statement like that of the sovereignty of God would terrify us if, if that were all we knew about God. But God is not only sovereign. He's perfect in love and in infinite wisdom, and he knows and does what is best. And as we see in our lesson, God will make use of men to accomplish his own purposes. He knows what people will do, how they will act, because he is all wise, all knowing, and yet he allows men to choose what they will do. He knew the religious leaders, the disciples, Judas, Peter's, Pilate, and Herod's heart, and what they would choose. He knew the people's hearts, that they would choose Barabbas. He knows your heart. He knows your heart and what you will choose. His plans works out, work out for what he wants to accomplish. So let me just give you a couple of applications of this section. How might you have betrayed Jesus this week, allowing your feelings or emotions to overshadow what you knew to be true? How have you experienced opposition recently of your faith in Jesus? And when and how have you seen God's sovereign plan for your life play out? What was your response when you were, when you did experience that opposition? Did you lash out and react in anger or fear or did you seek God and trust him and remain calm like Jesus? Well, my second division, uh, 2657 through 2710, we, we're going to talk about Jesus' trial before the Jewish leaders and also Peter's denial. Um, <clears throat> those who had arrested Jesus, they took him first to, to Annas. Our, our Matthew doesn't tell you that, but uh, 
you, you find it in other scriptures. They, they first took him to Annas, the former high priest, and that was around 2 a.m. in the morning, okay? And then they took him to Caiaphas, Annas' son-in-law, uh, who was the high priest at the time, and that was about 3 a.m. in the morning. And we read um, 57, uh, 60, if you want to read along with me, uh, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. And he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin, the whole Sanhedrin, were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. And finally, two came forward. They were determined, these religious leaders, they were, it was all predetermined. They were determined to find a way to convict Jesus and put him to death. They were seeking a charge that the Romans would accept because they didn't have the authority And so Jesus' trial before this Sanhedrin, this body of religious leaders, was filled with illegalities, violations of Jewish law. You know it was unlawful for a criminal court to be held at night? The Sanhedrin could not impose the death penalty on a criminal either. Only by the Roman government, and it had to be public, in public. The Jewish leaders waited until morning to announce their verdict, perhaps in a token attempt to legalize their unlawful gathering. And it also, it seems, Peter didn't follow the group that arrested Jesus with a motive of rescuing him. He was just more interested, I think, in, in seeing what would happen in the events in the garden. So we read in 60, again, 60 through 61, that finally two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. So they needed to find a charge, a chargeable offense that would merit death. But they could only find false evidence, only confusion and a lesser charge that Jesus spoke against the temple. You know, Mosaic law, Mosaic law required two, two confirming credible witnesses. But they twisted Jesus' words, didn't they? They took them out of context to make it a capital offense. If you read in the Gospel of John 2.19, John records that Jesus actually said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. He didn't say he was going to destroy it. He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. He never said that he would destroy the temple himself. So what was Jesus talking about here? He was talking about his, his body, not the building, not the temple, right? To be sure, Jesus is our true temple. But ironically, the religious leaders were about to destroy Jesus' body, as he had said, and three days later, he would rise from the dead. We read in 62 to 64, the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is the tes this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him again, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future, you, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus agreed with Caiaphas in the form of a restatement of his question without a direct answer, 
more of a recognition of the question than a clear reply. And in doing so, I think Jesus clearly acknowledged that he was the Messiah, the unique Son of God. Well, they took it as blasphemy, right? They took it as blasphemy. And Caiaphas took Jesus' reply as a confession of guilt, and he tore his robes as a sign of disgust which was actually a violation of, of Mosaic Code for a high priest also found in Leviticus. A lot of uh, inconsistencies here. So Jesus, uh, at 5 a.m., they confirm that he's, he's uh, this capital sentence, blasphemy. And again, let me repeat this. Jewish law prohibited the Sanhedrin meeting before daybreak in violation, total disregard. In fact, all criminal cases had to be tried and completed during the daytime, not the night. And no cases were supposed to be heard during the Passover season, especially on the eve of the feast day. So the witnesses were interrogated according to the law. Blasphemy could only be charged for taking God's name in vain, which Jesus never did. And they physically start to physically abuse Jesus. And in a symbolic fashion, they blindfold him and uh, strike him with his fist, with their fist, and ask, you know, who was that that struck you? denying his claim to be a prophet, a spit in his face, denial of his authority. What a scene. Clear humiliation and mockery of our Lord. And I think a lesson that we can learn here as, a, as an aside lesson, is that God's sovereign plans uphold his perfect justice despite human injustice. So what's become of Peter and of Judas? We read in 6970, Peter was sitting in the courtyard, a servant girl came up to him. You also were with Jesus, she said, but he denied it before them. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. They went to the gateway. Another girl said, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again, this time with an oath. I don't know the man. After a while, those standing uh, there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. And then he began to call them curses. You see how that progressed? Curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know this man. Immediately, the rooster crowed, and then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Judas, I think, as we look into, first, into chapter 27, Judas became a puppet caught in a web of intrigue spun out of hatred and confusion. He realized what he had done. The King James Version, uh, King James Version states, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, King James uses repented, repented himself. You know, remorse is often confused with repentance. Usually a person who repents doesn't go out and hang himself. So how are we to answer what happened here to Judas? I think the answer lies in the word repented. Repented. It's a different Greek word than the word most often used uh, meaning repent in the New Testament. Instead, this word is only used five times in the New Testament. And this word expression, expresses sorrow, remorse, grief for a wrong committed, and pretty much like when you get caught, right? 
If a person were willing to repent, he could change and be forgiven. But because he has no plans to repent and stop his, act, his sinful activities and rectify what he's done, he's gripped with remorse. Remorse. And consequently, this emotion produces no change in a person's life. So there's a huge difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse led to the return of the money. Um, but that's where it stopped. That's where it stopped. No turning to Jesus. Never recognized Jesus as Messiah. No repentance. And this was Judas's cry for help. But you see what the, these calloused leaders, supposed to be intercessors for the people, worry about the, and care for the people. You see what, what they did. They had no compassion for, for Judas. Hypocritical, uncaring, that, that's what their actions were. So let's consider some of the differences between in Judas's betrayal and Peter's denial. Judas, Judas's betrayal was premeditated, was consistent with his past actions. Peter's was a reaction in a moment of confusion and weakness, revealing his fear. Judas was followed by remorse and guilty withdrawal from Jesus. Peter's was followed by a heartfelt sorrow for his sin and repentance. And Judas, we know, made no attempt to reconcile with Jesus, Jesus or ask for forgiveness. Peter was restored through his repentant action, attitude and actions. It was his loyalty to Jesus, not his temporary denial of Jesus' leadership that shows the real Peter. He thought he could stand, but he failed miserably. Sometimes like we do. So my second principle is this. Jesus Christ understands and forgives repentant sinners. We see that in Peter's life, right? Jesus understands the human condition because he was human. Yet at the same time, he was God. He was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. And that's why he came as an innocent, perfect man to take the fall for us, to die for us sinful, guilty mankind, a substitute. When you and I do wrong things, when we sin, sometimes those things aren't found out. Sometimes they are. And we, we suffer the consequences. And we're condemned by people. Maybe even people uh, around us that say they love us and won't forgive us. Um, sometimes even, you know, this world, even our brothers and sisters in Christ won't, gener gen you know, uh, won't generally let us slide. They can be unforgiving. Even when we repent of that sin. But Jesus, on the other hand, promises to always understand and forgive us when we confess our sins with genuine sorrow and truly repent of our sins. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise, men, promise from Jesus. Not only will he forgive us, but he'll help us and to restore us through his spirit, to restore us. There should be nothing that we feel that we can never be forgiven for. Jesus will forgive you even of your darkest, deepest secret sin if you will but, will but choose to bring it to him. Well, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself in those who despised, mocked, and falsely accused Jesus? How have you possibly denied Jesus? When you recognize your sin, do you respond like Judas, only with remorse, or like Peter, with repentance? 
Last division, 27, 11 through 31. This, again, the Sanhedrin found Jesus guilty of a crime, worthy of death in their eyes, but, uh, but not in the Romans' eyes. And <clears throat> it's interesting that in the Jews' death was by stoning, but a Roman death sentence would provide for, the, for Jesus the most humiliating death he could possibly suffer, which is crucifixion. Do you, do you see God's sovereign plan at work here again? Little did they know that their desire was again a fulfillment of prophecy. So they determined to put Jesus to death. They handed it over to Pilate to get his approval. Pilate, uh, the governor or prefix since 26 AD, um, he agreed to the truth Pilate stated. Jesus agreed to the truth that Pilate stated, as, as did Caiaphas, about him being... Uh, the king of the Jews, the son of man, but no, made no reply to a single charge made by his accusers. And so the other gospels accounts tell us that learning that Jesus was a Galilean and under Herod's jurisdiction, they sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at the time, and then Herod sent him back to Pilate. <clears throat> and they found, none of them found any basis for the Jewish religious charges Nothing to deserve death. Pilate knew. He knew, as the scripture tells us, where the, the Jewish leaders' hearts were, right? And he had been warned uh, three different times. He chose to ignore, ignore that. Um, and so he, he asked for Barabbas' release and for Jesus' death. And we know that Jesus was handed over then. Uh, it, Pilate's decision came down about 6.30 in the morning, about 6.30 in the morning. Pilate didn't have to condemn Jesus. He knew what was just, but he yielded to the truth. He yielded to the Jews, to the crowd. And about 7 a.m., Pilate releases Barabbas. He has Jesus whipped and then taken away. The scripture tells us to be crucified. And we see again God's sovereign plan required Jesus' sacrificial death, right? Out of Jesus' willing act of submission comes eternal life possible for all who believe. So my last principle is God's sovereign plans require Jesus' sacrificial death. God's sovereign plans required Jesus' sacrificial death. You know, every person who rejects Jesus has to pay that penalty of sin. They're on their own. God's general revelation of himself is seen as creation in the world around us. Um, his special revelation is seen in the person of Jesus and the truth of his word. Were Pilate and Herod and the Roman soldiers or the Jewish crowd innocent before God? No. God had given them more than enough opportunities to recognize who Jesus was, but they refused. They denied the evidence. And you know, man, what one does with the truth about God and about Jesus, that determines your eternal destiny. He suffered for you and for me because we needed a substitute, a perfect, sinless substitute. And the good news, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus took your sin and my sin away upon himself on the cross and he suffered he suffered for Mike Toma you know he suffered for John Angel Greg Jordan right Mike Baldwin he suffered for us so that we could have life and he paid the death penalty that we deserve what have you done with the light or the truth about Jesus that God has revealed to you in Matthew, in this study, and other scriptures?
Do you truly believe that Jesus died for you personally, for your sins, past, present, and future? And how have you responsibly received this truth and embraced the person of Christ in your life? You know, it's easy to ignore what the Bible says, isn't it? Even though the truth's right there. Because the world is always throwing the lie, the big lie, at us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you as the only all-wise God and Jesus as the unique Son of God, our Savior and Lord, the Lamb of God who was abused and broken and put to death for all sinners. And Lord, we acknowledge that we are weak in our own power, that we, even though we love we love you, we are capable of denying you. We know that we are only made strong when we seek and submit to and follow your spirit. Thank you for remaining faithful to God's plan, to your mission as our sin bearer, as our sacrifice and our savior. Thank you for submitting to the suffering that we deserved and for your example to follow your father's will. May we boldly live our lives with consistency and conviction and in your wisdom as we submit to you, as we seek your guidance and trust you in everything that we say and do. Lord, give us those spiritual eyes to see your plan for our lives. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.